있는 그대로의 자신들을 바라봐주는 삶 그런 사회 평등하다는 말이 사라진 사회인 것 같아요 기회가 똑같이 주어지는 것 같아요 오늘 더 안전한 사회인 것 같아요 모두가 두려워하지 않는 사회라고 생각을 해요 서로 이해하는 마음을 가지고 다 같이 만들어 나가는 그런 사회 여성과 남성 모두 공정하고 차별받지 않는 성평등 사회를 실현해야 한다는 청년들의 목소리에 답하고 대안을 모색해야 할 때입니다. 여성가족부는 제2회 2021 대한민국 성평등 포럼을 개최하여 미래를 여는 새로운 성평등 사회를 위한 과제와 대안을 논의하고자 합니다. 청년들의 다양한 의견을 수렴하기 위해 여성가족부는 본 포럼에 앞서 청년들이 참여하는 온라인 공문장을 개최하였습니다. 총 94명의 청년들이 10월 2일부터 10월 4일까지 3일간 1. 안전, 디지털화와 성평등에 대해 논의하였습니다. 온라인 공문장에서 논의한 내용은 실제 참여한 청년들이 연사가 되어 주제별 세션에서 직접 소개합니다. 본 포럼은 청년들이 중심이 되는 미래 성평등 사회를 위한 방향성을 모색하는 것을 시작으로 일자리, 고용 불안과 불평등 문제를 살펴보고자 합니다. 온 오프라인에서 일상을 위협하는 안전 문제를 점검해보고 디지털 시대로의 전환을 맞아 새롭게 나타나는 성평등 의제에 대하여 논의해볼 것입니다. 주제별 세션을 진행한 이유는 성평등 사회를 향한 종합적인 대안을 모색합니다. 이번 성평등 포럼은 미래 세대인 청년들이 우리 사회 당면 과제들을 함께 논의하고 서로를 이해하는 소통의 기회가 될 것입니다. 공정과 포용, 평등과 존중의 가치를 바탕으로 성평등 사회를 실현하기 위한 대안을 모색하는 2021 대한민국 성평등 포럼 지금 시작합니다. 안녕하십니까. 2021 대한민국 성평등 포럼 사회를 맡은 아나운서 김하나입니다. 반갑습니다. 평등이라는 말이 더 이상 필요 없어진 사회, 청년들이 말하는 새로운 성평등 사회를 함께 만들어가기 위해서 오늘 우리는 이 자리에 모였습니다. 올해로 2회째를 맞이하게 되는 대한민국 성평등 포럼 사회적 거리 두기로 온라인으로 인사를 드리게 됐는데요 온라인으로 함께 하고 계신 모든 분들 진심으로 환영합니다 그리고 감사드립니다 이번 포럼은 미래를 여는 새로운 성평등 세상을 주제로 일과 안전 그리고 디지털 전환 이렇게 다양한 분야에서 청년들이 직면하고 있는 현실을 만나보고 더 나은 미래를 만들고자 합니다. 2021년 현재 우리 시대 청년들은 높은 성평등 의식으로 이 고용상 성차별, 경력단절, 직장 내 성희롱, 그리고 디지털 성범죄 등의 문제를 현실에서 체감하고 적극적으로 개선을 요구하고 있습니다. 그리고 코로나19로 심화하고 있는 실업 그리고 고용 불안, 가속화하는 디지털 전환 속에서 나타나는 성불평등 문제들은 청년들이 새롭게 도전해야 하는 도전 과제들이 되겠죠. 자, 그래서 오늘부터 이틀간 온라인으로 미래 세대인 청년들이 서로 소통하고 대안을 마련하는 공론의 장을 만들어가고자 합니다. 자 그러면 여러분과 함께 미래를 여는 새로운 성평등 세상 2021 대한민국 성평등 포럼을 지금부터 시작하겠습니다. 개회식의 첫 번째 순서로 정영의 여성가족부 장관님의 개회사가 있겠습니다. 단상으로 모시겠습니다. 마음으로 환영해 주십시오. 안녕하십니까. Good afternoon. As have been introduced, I am Cheng Yonghae, Minister of Gender Equality and Family. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the 2021 Korea Gender Equality Forum. I would like to express my appreciation to His Excellency Moon Jae-in, President of the Republic of Korea, His Excellency Park Byung-suk, Speaker of the National Assembly, Her Excellency Delphine Oh of the UN Gen Generation Equality Forum, as well as former Minister Cheng Hyun-baek of the Ministry of 
gender equality and family for participating as speakers and discussants. A special thank you to the Secretary General of uh, UN Women, as well as all other participants who have joined us despite the different timelines and locations. In October, we have hold, held an online platform for dialogue to gather the voices of the youth. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the youth who have participated in the platform and for those who will be presenting today. In 2021, we have many challenges ahead of us to achieve gender equality in our society. We see that the issues of employment and the lack of security and jobs is creating various challenges for both men and women alike in our changing world. We are here with the request to create a gender equal society for all. And so the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family is now holding the 2021 Korea Gender Equality Forum under the topic of gender equality, paving the way towards a better future. We are taking a look at the topics of jobs, safety, and digitization, along with the challenges faced by our youth. The youth are now participating in various dialogue along with the civic society, academia, government, and international organization. Against the backdrop of a very high awareness for gender equality, sexual harassment in the workplace, gender-based digital crimes, and sexual discrimination in employment is something that they experience in their everyday lives and which they are looking for challenges. We can see that the youth wishes to create a society where the society sees me as me to create an equal opportunity for all, a society where no one lives in fear and a safe society. We believe that the experience that we have is very different from one another and therefore the awareness and recognition as well as ideas could be different as well. We believe that dialogue is becoming more difficult because of the aggravation of inequality and the very difficult and fierce economic environment. And therefore, the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family actually created a platform for dialogue online to invite 100 men and women to discuss the tasks and challenges as well as a solution for a gender equal society. We discussed issues of work, safety, and digitization. It was an opportunity for frank exchanges amongst the youth, both men and women, to explore the reasons and solutions. The youth will lead our future, and therefore, we believe that it was a great opportunity to discuss gender equality with the future generations, and it was an opportunity to resolve awareness gaps between genders. We will be sharing the impressions of the participants today and tomorrow through the presentations titled Voices from the Youth. The process of communicating and exploring solutions together is much needed for a gender equal society of the future. It will indeed motivate our society to become a more mature democracy. This forum is being held both online and offline. I do hope that all of us can share this aspiration to create a new gender equal society beyond the crisis that we face today, especially the youth against the backdrop of the values of fairness, inclusion, equality and respect, I hope that you will directly participate in dialogue for a gender equal society. I look forward to this becoming a very meaningful platform for dialogue. Once again, thank you for your participation and welcome to the forum. Thank you very much. That was Minister Tong Young -ye of Gender Equality and Family. Thank you very much. We want to open a new world of gender equality that is dreamed of by the youth generation and Korea will usher in that world for all of us. And with those words, we have officially declared open this forum. Now we would like to hear for all of you to thank all of the audiences here at the 2021 Korea Gender Equality Forum. We have President Moon Jae-in with his congratulatory marks.
북경행동강령 25주년과 유엔 안보리 결의안 1325호 20주년을 기념하여 시작된 대한민국 성평등 포럼이 두 번째를 맞이했습니다. 성평등 사회를 위한 우리의 의지와 국제연대를 더욱 굳게 다지는 계기가 되길 바랍니다. 특별히 올해 포럼에서는 평등 사회에 대한 청년들의 솔직한 목소리를 전할 예정입니다. 치열하게 고민하고 토론하며 대한민국의 미래 청사진을 그려낸 청년들을 격려합니다. 이번 포럼을 준비해 주신 정령의 여성가족부 장관님을 비롯해 관계자 여러분의 노고에도 깊이 감사드립니다. 존경하는 국민 여러분, 청년 여러분, 우리는 평등하고 지속가능한 사회를 향해 쉼없이 달려왔습니다. 1995년 여성발전기본법을 제정하고 20년 만에 양성평등기본법으로 전면 개정했습니다. 정치와 경제, 사회, 문화 모든 영역에서 성평등이 실현될 수 있도록 제도의 범위를 넓혀왔습니다. 여전히 부족하지만 기업과 공공 분야에서 여성 대표성이 강화되고 있습니다. 경력 단절 여성에 대한 지원이 확대되고 남성의 육아휴직 사용도 빠르게 정착되고 있습니다. 여성과 남성 모두 평등하게 자신의 역량을 발휘할 수 있어야 한다는 의식이 이뤄낸 성과입니다. 평등한 사회적 분위기 속에서 나고 자란 우리 청년들은 공정과 정의를 가장 진지하게 생각하는 세대입니다. 기존 제도와 구조의 한계를 뛰어넘어 새로운 세계로 거침없이 나아가는 용기 있고 역동적인 세대입니다. 때로는 젠더 갈등, 세대 내 격차와 같은 진통을 겪지만 청년들은 서로의 차이를 직시하며 포용하려고 노력합니다. 끊임없이 소통하며 연대해 나간다면 기성세대가 풀지 못한 불평등과 불공정 같은 어려운 과제에 대해 뻔뜩이는 해법을 분명 발견할 수 있을 것이라 확신합니다. 우리 청년들은 자신의 행복과 타인의 권리를 함께 지키며 서로 다채롭게 빛을 바라는 삶을 살아갈 것입니다. 각계 전문가 여러분께서도 지혜를 아낌없이 모아주시길 부탁드립니다. 정부 또한 미래 세대를 위해 더욱 노력하겠습니다. 작년에 청년기본법이 처음으로 시행되어 청년의 권리를 보호하고 지원할 제도적 기반이 갖춰졌습니다. 민간위원 60%를 청년으로 구성한 청년정책조정위원회도 출범했습니다. 비로소 청년이 정책의 중심이자 주체가 되었습니다. 지난 8월에는 청년들 스스로 청년 특별 대책을 세워 발표했습니다. 정부는 청년들과 함께 5대 분야 87개 과제를 차질 없이 추진할 것입니다. 청년 누구나 동등하게 삶의 행복을 향유할 수 있는 새로운 세상을 만들어 가겠습니다. 서로를 존중하며 자란 세대가 어떻게 세상을 바꿔나갈지 기대됩니다. 이번 포럼을 통해 청년들이 국경과 세대, 성별을 넘어 소통하고 성평등 사회를 실현하기 위해 연대하고 협력하길 바랍니다. 다시 한번 2021년 대한민국 성평등 포럼의 개막을 축하합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. We have just heard from His Excellency Moon Jae-in, President of the Republic of Korea. To create a new world of gender equality, we have the youth generation. Thank you for your remarks. We would now like to turn to His Excellency Park Byung-suk, Speaker of the National Assembly, for his remarks. We will invite his video message. I am Park Byung-suk, Speaker of the National Assembly. Congratulations on the opening of the 2021 Korea Gender Equality Forum. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Minister Chung Young-ae and her ministry for 
organizing this forum. Her Excellency Delphin O, oh, Secretary General of the UN Generation Equality Forum, Former Minister Chung Hyung Baek of the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, speakers and discussants, thank you for your participation. Gender equality paving the way towards a better future is the topic for today's forum. In particular, we will be taking a look at alternatives for a gender equal society from the perspective of the youth. Work, safety, digital are the key words for this forum. In order to move towards a gender equal society, these are the hurdles that the youth must overcome. The COVID-19 pandemic was more painful to the youth and women. This fact is reflected in the OECD job statistics. With digital transformation, there is concern about gender inequality being aggregated. The youth of our society has gone through fierce competition for entering university, for finding jobs, and also housing. We see that suicide rates are increasing, and depression amongst women in their 20s is also quite severe. The future is in the hands of the youth. Those of us living today must make sure that we listen carefully to the voice of the youth, and we need to make sure that we re rebuild the bridge of hope. In a society where the youth stops dreaming, we have no future. The National Assembly will do our part to find solutions together with you. At this forum, I look forward to practical discussions in creating a gender equal, equal society. Going beyond gender, generation, and borders, I do hope that we can create a gender equal society together. Thank you. We hope that the youth would never give up on their hope that they will open up a future of their dreams. We'd like to thank the Speaker of the National Assembly for his words. We also have another congratulatory remarks by video. Last year at the 2020 Korea Gender Equality Forum, this speaker attended the forum as a speaker. We would like to hear from Anita Batia, the Deputy Executive Director Director of UN Women. Your Excellency, Ms. Chung Young Ai, Minister of Gender Equality and Family of the Republic of Korea, Excellencies, distinguished participants, it is my pleasure to send this message as the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. I congratulate the Republic of Korea for convening the second Gender Equality Forum under the theme Gender Equality paving the way towards a better future. I had the pleasure to participate in last year's forum as a speaker, and I'm delighted to be joining you again this year. Ladies and gentlemen, the recent 25 year review of the implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action revealed that despite important steps, not a single country in the world has achieved gender parity. Progress for gender equality is faltering and hard-won gains are being reversed. UN Women has flagged that the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating pre-existing inequalities, pushing millions into extreme poverty. Women are the worst affected. Meanwhile, the shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls rages on. Overall, instability and economic insecurity further expose young women and girls to multiple forms of discrimination, exploitation, and abuse. I am glad to see that the forum has rightfully placed youth at its center. Today's young people are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, including particularly in the areas of education and employment. Meanwhile, young people coming together in joint action has served as a major engine of social transformation. Girls in particular constitute a tremendous powerhouse for transformational change for gender equality. The new generation of young people 
many of them born after the Beijing conference, are building forward better and differently. They are at the forefront of global action for change, both in responding to the pandemic and in working to address the systemic inequalities that the pandemic has unearthed. UN Women's vision, as exemplified in the Generation Equality Forum, is to continue to engage the new generation in the fight for gender equality, to promote the voice and the leadership of young people, including adolescent girls, and to support youth participation in decision-making. We must formulate robust policies that guarantee, protect, and respect the effective participation of girls. We must ensure that adequate resources and funding are devoted to girls. We must ensure that girls co-design all technology initiatives so that they are truly at the heart of and benefit from the digital revolution. The Generation Equality Forum held earlier this year has engaged thousands of young advocates fostering a global youth movement for gender equality. We also have established the Generation Equality Youth Task Force. And UN Women, in collaboration with girls, young people, UN agencies, and civil society organizations, launched the Youth Journey as a roadmap for young people to own generation equality. I would like to thank the Republic of Korea for providing this platform in the true spirit of intergenerational leadership. Our partnership with the Republic of Korea is an extremely important strategic partnership. And our close working relationship with the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family will be further strengthened by the establishment of the UN Women Center of Excellence in Korea later this year. We are looking forward to seeing the Republic of Korea further leverage its vibrant and global youth culture, as well as its unique experience of fast economic and social transformation to lead in the global efforts to bridge the intergenerational and gender divide. All of us benefited from seeing BTS perform at the UN General Assembly earlier this year. This kind of intergenerational leadership is what the Republic of Korea excels in, and it is a model for the rest of the world. I wish you a very successful forum. Thank you very much. 네, 함께 해주시는 모든 분들께 Thank you very much for your remarks. We have just heard from Deputy Executive Director Anita Bhatia. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those who have sent us their congratulatory remarks. And as they have mentioned, we look forward to having this forum serving as an opportunity to create a gender equal society through cooperation between men and women in nations, international societies, and civic societies. We would now like to invite Her Excellency Delphine O, oh, Secretary General of the UN Generation Equality Forum, as our keynote speaker. Her topic is Generation Equality Forum today and tomorrow. Dear Minister Chung, dear participants of the forum, it is with great pleasure that I have accepted the invitation of the Ministry to give the keynote address to this second edition of the Korea Gender Equality Forum. I would like to congratulate the Minister and the Ministry for Gender Equality and Family for holding the initiative of this very important now annual forum and for giving me the opportunity to address the crowd. I very much regret that I cannot be in person with you now in Seoul, but I do hope to give my contribution to the discussions with all the participants. I will give a presentation following a PowerPoint, which will be shown as I speak. 
As you might know, I am the ambassador for gender equality of the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs, as well as the Secretary General of the Generation Equality Forum. I am sure you have heard about the Generation Equality Forum. What was the idea behind this huge international forum for women's rights? Well, very plainly, we noticed that it had been actually 25 or 26 years, dating back to 1995, since the last conference, worldwide conference on gender equality took place in Beijing in 1995. And so three years ago, UN Women did, decided to convene a new international summit, the largest global feminist gathering to advance gender equality in the past quarter of a decade. Two countries came together to co-host this forum, Mexico and France, a first part of the forum took place in April in Mexico, and the second part took place at the end of June of this year in Paris. This forum was half presential, half digital, uh, and it welcomed more than 50,000 people who were connected to watch the opening ceremony, and about uh, 1,000 people in Paris in June. Now, what are the key features, and this is my first slide, of the Generation Equality Forum in Paris? First, what we needed very plainly are concrete new commitments. And new commitments, this is investment in gender equality. I'll come back to that later. Second, the way that we worked is with a renewed way of doing multilateralism. You know that President Macron of France, France is very committed to having multilateralism solve uh, important issues of this world, and gender equality is one of them. Third, we had a real intergenerational and, and, and intersectional engagements with different groups of women, with disabilities, LGBTQI, indigenous women, and so on. Fourth, we had a real co-leadership model in the way that we designed the forum, but also in the way that we implemented the decisions uh, bringing together at the governance table of the forum in what we call the core group, representatives of Mexico and France, representatives from UN Women, but also civil society organizations, NGOs, and what we called a youth task force. So we had youth voices that were actually at the decision table, the decision making table together with us to decide what is gonna be the path of the forum, what will be our objectives, what should be our results and how we will organize in the end, as you can see in the statistics, we had a very strong youth representation. 20% um, of uh, the people engaged virtually were between 25 and 35 years, but we had even more uh, young people, younger than 24, that were uh, committed. And we're very happy also that it was really gender equal in the sense that we have only 56% of the participants were females, and so the rest of it were also men. What are the key results of the forum? I wanna go uh, straight forward to it. We managed to raise $40 billion of investment for gender equality. It has been again 25 years since the international community has not come together in order to raise money very concretely for concrete and practical projects and programs and actions throughout the world. So we had bold commitments. Uh, we launched a five-year action journey uh, with a global acceleration plan for gender equality. Uh, we'll come back to that. We also launched a new compact on women, peace and security. And um, I cannot go into detail because this would take much too much time, but we had a flurry of new initiatives to promote gender equality and women's rights in um, areas of health, of sports, of culture, education, gender responsive policies, trade, and so on. So the core of the results, the core of the commitments were embedded in what we called our action coalitions. So we, very early on, we had defined six thematic areas, gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, climate justice, uh, economic justice and rights, technology and innovation, and feminist movements and leadership. And around the six themes, we gathered a number of member states, international organizations, private sector companies, philanthropies, but also civil society organizations and youth groups that actually worked for two years, uh, thanks to the pandemic, in order to design the commitments that should be made through each of the action coalition and what would be the roadmap of each of these action coalitions for the next five years. 
So here in the next slide, you have an example of some of the actions that will be taken for each of the six action coalitions. I'm not gonna go into detail. I just wanted to give some examples of these actions in two of the areas that I know of our interest for the Korea Gender Equality Forum, uh, namely economic justice and gender equality in the work environment and also digital and innovation. So in the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition, um, we launched a global alliance for care uh, which should uh, take care of the issue of care work, which you know is disproportionately allocated to women and girls around the world um, in order to um, actually uh, fund, uh, to normalize core responsibility for care, to protect the labor rights of care workers, and more importantly, to develop universal public care systems. We had also the 2x challenge collaborative coming into uh, the action coalition in order to increase uh, the funding of gender equality, and especially in the field of gender finance and innovation in the culture of investment. We also supported uh, the ratification and uh, the implementation of the um, International Labor Organization Convention number 190, which uh, you know is um, up to date, the most progressive, the most sophisticated legal instrument to protect uh, the rights of women uh, and to protect against gender-based violence and sexual harassment in the workplace. In this action coalition, we had major member states uh, such as Sweden, uh, Germany, um, the European Commission, uh, Mexico, South Africa, the uh, Gates of Foundation um, and other big NGOs. In the technology and digital world, we had also one action coalition with different actions. Uh, those are examples that you can see in the presentation. Um, the technology we need will support the creation of technology across the global south uh, in order to respond to the needs of rights and women, to the rights of women and, and girls. So we had focused in this action coalition on the two sides. First, how do we increase the presence and the power of women and girls in the tech industry? And second, how do we make sure at the same time that um, new technology products in high tech um, will not increase gender inequality, for instance, in algorithm, in international, uh, in um, artificial intelligence, sorry, uh, and so on. And overall, we also need to work on uh, increasing access of young girls, to uh, the dig digital world. I know it's not an issue in Korea, but in many places of the world, uh, young girls do not have access to digital education in computers and smartphones. So overall, as I said, we managed to raise $40 billion uh, in commitments by over a thousand entities encompassing governments, uh, private sector, of course, but also philanthropies and international organizations. Here you can see an um, interesting breakdown of a, the portion that was uh, allotted by government and private sector companies. So about one third of the commitments were made by governments around the world, not only from the global north, but we had also a number of countries from the global south. Uh, one another third of commitments were made by private sector companies, and then the rest of it was um, scattered bet between international uh, financial institutions, philanthropies, regionalizations, and the UN system. Um, and you can see there was a very strong focus of commitments towards two of the action coalitions, the one on economic justice and rights, uh, which gathered actually almost two thirds of the commitments, as well as the one on coalition on gender-based violence. We're very proud that we managed to gather and to invite and to mobilize a number of member states. 61 United Nations member states have committed to the six action coalitions. You can see them here highlighted in pink, uh, but don't be fooled by the shade of pink. We had actually countries from all continents. Uh, in South America, for instance, of course, uh, we had Mexico, we had Argentina, Uruguay, and also smaller countries uh, such as um, Costa Rica. In Africa, we had very, very strong commitments from regional leaders such as Kenya, uh, South Africa, Senegal, Ethiopia, but also very uh, smaller countries such as um, Malawi, 
uh, Botswana or Burkina Faso um, and other countries. We had also uh, a number of countries in the Asia Pacific, such as uh, South Korea, unfortunately not as many as we had hoped, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, some countries in uh, um, Central Asia, such as Kazakhstan, and also in the Caucasus, uh, such as um, Georgia and Armenia. Um, and then most of the uh, Western European countries and North American countries also have committed. This is a very important map of the world. We need to show that gender equality is not a Western or a global North issue. It's actually an issue where political leaders around the world, uh, whatever their religious um, principles may be, whatever their culture may be, whatever their beliefs may be, are gathering and committing to gender equality. Um, here in the next slide, you can also see a number of um, very important commitments that we had, uh, singling out, for instance, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation of $2 billion over uh, to advance women's leadership, uh, reproductive health and economic empowerment. Uh, we had the World Bank coming in, um, the United States government, of course, also philanthropies such as the Malala Fund for Education, Open Society Foundation, and then we had smaller uh, NGOs such as Girls for Climate, Alliance Droit et Santé, which works on uh, comprehensive sexual education in Western Africa, and other NGOs also coming in. Um, I know that youth voices are going to be uh, really highlighted in the Korea Gender Equality Forum, and I also wanted to elaborate on the way that we at the Generation Equality Forum uh, managed to involve the youth from a very early stage on um, up until uh, the end of the Generation Equality Forum. Um, so as I said, we had a governance body called the core group in which very early on we had included representatives from the youth, uh, what we call the youth task force. So those are 40 young people across the world, across the continent, um, women, but also men, uh, LGBTQI representatives who were sitting at the decision making uh, table and helped us uh, really also make sure that the roadmaps of the Action Coalition were answering to the demands and the needs of the youth. UN Women had also set up a cohort of 300 national gender youth advocates who led outreach and mobilization at the country level in a number of, of different countries. Uh, and finally, during the forum itself, we had invited a number of youth representatives in the in-person opening ceremony in Paris. Uh, we had them go on stage and engage directly in dialogue with UN Secretary General, with uh, President Macron, with uh, then UN Executive, uh, UN Women Executive Director uh, Pumzile Mamblum Nuka, and with high-level leaders of this world. And then we had over a hundred digital events over three days, and we made sure that what we call one of our digital stage was actually we handed over the keys of the digital stage to the youth task force. So this youth task force actually had their own space, digital space to organize their own events, to choose and select from uh, their own constituencies in order to promote and uh, advance uh, the voices of the youth. And we had also taken into account a young feminist manifesto, uh, which was um, transmitted to the Generation Equality Forum leadership. At the same time, we made sure that we elevated the youth voices through a youth week of action in a number of society videos, uh, through social media, because we know that uh, the young people are very much present on social media. And so we had a number of young ambassadors being also the voice uh, and the platform for the Generation Equality Forum with a new hashtag to make sure that we engage with youth all across the world. Finally, if I can give some um, elements of what were the key factors of success of the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, first, the multi-stakeholder governance structure, the fact that we had, again, not just the governments talking to the governments or to the international organizations, but talking to the civil society, uh, sitting at the same table, to uh, the young people, to also the private sector, the companies, philanthropies, um, and so on. We also uh, had a co-creation design process for uh, the six action coalitions and the global acceleration plan for gender equality to make sure that um, those who were committing through the action coalition 
uh, whether they were member states or uh, NGOs or private sector companies, they did not come after we had designed the roadmap. They actually contributed, they actually co-designed the roadmap themselves. So now they're accountable for the decisions they have made themselves, such um, similar to what you would have uh, in a company board, for instance. And then at the, at the final stage, we had a very important leverage of digital tools and platforms to make sure that we expanded the outreach efforts and the engagement with a successful online campaign. So uh, my last slide is a picture of some of the key speakers who were at the opening ceremony. At the center, you can see President Macron, our own gender equality minister, Elizabeth Moreno. Uh, to her left, you can actually spot Hillary Clinton, who was there. Um, you have um, a number of uh, UN uh, very high officials, um, the president of Georgia um, and other presidents, but you also have young people uh, to the left in an African dress. You have you, the um, uh, African Union special envoy for youth uh, and a number of um, civil society representatives who were uh, on stage. So this is what uh, the Generation Equality Forum was. And um, after this, we now have five years to make sure that we do good on our promises. And then the commitments, the $40 billion commitments that were made in Paris will be fulfilled. So the action coalitions will continue to meet and gather. They will um, make sure to fulfill the roadmap and the goals they have set themselves for the five-year road plan. And we plan to meet probably um, halfway through the five-year road plan. And then at the end of the five years in 2026, with a new summit uh, to launch a new dynamic for gender equality. Now, the Korea Gender Equality Forum is obviously a very different uh, initiative. It is at a national level, but I can see uh, very gladly that it has also has included civil society organizations, feminist associations, uh, youth organizations, and it has given them a voice. I think it's very important to understand today that it's impossible to advance gender equality just by talking in the echo chamber of governments and international organizations. We need to have uh, cross pollinization so to say, uh, between the different actors of civil society, including also with the private sector. I will leave it at that and I would like to um, uh, encourage and congratulate the ministry and all of all the, all the participants, sorry, of the Gender Equality uh, Forum and wish you a great Thank success. You. Thank you very much. That was Secretary General Dolphine Oh with her keynote address, as you've just seen in the video. Through solidarity and cooperation of the international community, we do hope that the achievements for the five years would come to pass. Next, we'd like to move to our second keynote speaker who will be talking about gender equality, paving the way towards a better future, solidarity toward an alternative society going beyond the crisis. This is Professor Meritus of Song Kyung Gwan University, a former Minister of Gender Equality of Family, Tong Hyun Baek. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to meet you. I've just been introduced. My name is Chong Hyun Baek. I will be giving you an address today. Today, I would like to talk about gender equality, paving the way towards a better future, but moving beyond through solidarity towards an alternative society. As you know, the pandemic era is this means that we are in, living in a society of crisis. However, this also means that we can open up a transition into the next world, that this could be a strong basis for that. At this point in time, through Korea's strong disease control measures, we have seen a heightened level of trust for the state. And through openness and transparency, Korea successfully became a model case for disease control. There was high civic participation in the disease control efforts. And based on openness and transparency with this high level of civic participation, 70% of the Korean people now say that we have joined the ranks of advanced nations, which is why Park Tae-ung's new book, where I woke up to find that I'm living in an advanced nation, is a very popular bestseller. This book tells us many of the things that we should think about as we move to become an advanced nation. We have democratic civic-mindedness, 
more interest in politics, and also more expectations for the social community. However, at the same time, we see heightened level of social trust, but we have the tendency to push aside the citizens that we think could be a threat to one another. This means to say that there is high level of trust for the state, high level of social trust, and high level of institutional trust, but we don't have a lot of trust regarding our society as a whole. Therefore, Korea is a society with low levels of trust. There is not a high level of trust regarding moving up and down the ladder or regarding the fairness of our laws. That's why when you talk with the youth generation, they talk about kids born with a golden spoon or silver spoon in their mouths or a dirt spoon in their mouths. This means to say that there is more trust about what the community can do, but we are still very self-centered when it comes to our relationship with our neighbors. The 50 million people in Korea also represents 50 million members of new stock exchange accounts. New traders uh, typically of the 2030 generation, they are about 54.1% of the number of new traders. And these new traders typically are in the red. In fact, 60% are in the red. And from 2017 to 2020, of the families with the head of household under 29 years of age, their total assets have seen a decrease. However, the commission fees of the 57 uh, exchange securities companies have gone beyond 13.6 trillion. Korean won, whereas their assets on average is about 2.48 million. However, the young generation continued to trade stocks because of the high real estate property prices and the gap, where in our generation, if you have graduated college after a few years, you would be able to purchase a home, but the young generation today cannot do that. They cannot purchase property, so there is intergenerational and intragenerational gaps. The intragenerational gaps, of course, represent the different gaps among the generations, kids who are wealthy, kids who are not. Of course, I think that Trading stocks in and of itself is not bad. It's a great way for companies to fund their operations. However, in this very highly volatile market, I am concerned that the young generation's lives might be mortgaged. We should be able to live in a society where average, ordinary lives can be guaranteed with the high social welfare networks, even without having to trade stocks or trade in such volatile markets. So this is something that should be guaranteed with public funding, which is why we talk about these subsidized funds and universal income. When it comes to employment, I think that this is one of the biggest concerns for the young generation. In this current reality, the state also has to think about housing rights, the right to housing, because I know that high property prices is very difficult for all of us. Housing, medicine, education, culture, these social services have to be increased in terms of their quality and quantity because this is a right that everyone should have access to to lead stable lives, and we should require them. However, social welfare spending is 11.2% of our GDP as of 2015 which is quite low compared to the OECD average of 22.4 percent. In 2021, the non-regular workers, only about 74 percent, have employment insurance. And loneliness is also something that is threatening our democracy because in this unfair and unequal reality, there are these young generations who are living as a single household, a single person household in a very tiny apartment, feeling lonely and empty. And this loneliness would have cause to lead to self-hatred because this person might wonder what kind of existence he's living, what kind of meaning he has. And this kind of hatred might manifest itself towards someone else. And therefore, this hate can lead to further discrimination, which is why we need to have 
We need to see this as a threat to democracy. In 2018, according to Korea Research, an opinion poll, about 26% of the respondents say that I often, almost always, feel lonely, and 40% of the respondents in their 20s have said that they always feel lonely. In 2018, the UK have seen that there was a report that 9 million people in the UK feel and suffer from loneliness, which is why they appointed a minister of loneliness. Which is why when we take a look at all of these different situations, we have to confront our realities. However, there is one ray of hope, which is that the Internet and media have very strong influence. And we're also seeing that this uh, consumerist tendency and the consumerist flow is also there. So rather than looking at ideological differences of liberal and conservative, there is a stronger, emotionally more integrated civic political group with that is headed by women and the younger generation, and they're using a new kind of grammar and a language to try to integrate themselves. However, what is depressing is that we're seeing more civic participation, we're seeing more public participation, but although they participate in politics, they do so in an individualized way, which is why these days I feel that uh, Korean politics is pretty much led by pollsters. In this current situation, we also see the rise of online feminism. Today, I, I feel that uh, in my speech, I am talking about many different elements that may be seen as separate from one another, but I want to talk about these separate but uh, similar elements so that we can find a way forward. With this rise of online feminism, this is very important because the women are the agents with Me Too movement, School Me Too, digital gender violence, and gender discrimination in the labor market markets, we are seeing that women are surfacing as agents. When I was minister and Taehang no, this uh, about 50,000 to 60,000 women participated in this inconvenient truth, protests, about five protests when the temperatures are climbing 34 to 35 degrees in the summer weather, I always say that this was the single largest women-only movement held since the history of Korea. Through this, we were able to see that digital gender violence and gender violence as a whole were issues that these women raised, and the government quickly had to work to try to respond to this and started establishing different centers and facilities. However, at the same time, although there were these positive movements. This also shows that there is strong hatred for women in our societies. So in cyberspace, it's become very much politicized, and there's constant warfare. I've also had roundtables with middle school girls and high school girls, where I was able to see that in the schools, there's so much hatred for girls, and that this is becoming a pure culture among boys. I know it's also very difficult for young men out there because they see women as a threat to their economic security. This hatred for women is not necessarily an extreme hatred for women by men. It's also something that is tied in to the, the, the insecurity that men feel. So this is a structured sort of gendered imbalance and gender inequality in Korean society, a very serious phenomenon about the minorities in our society. This is not necessarily about pitting men against women, that this is something about the weak and ties the solidarity for the minorities in our society. There is also strong hatred for feminists and feminism, and there are some women who participate in this effort. When they write op-eds in the newspaper, they say that I am not a feminist, but and etc. I am very angry when I read these statements because I try to meet with these different professors and we have lectures and comments in the National Assembly and we have worked really hard to try to increase the number of female professors in Korean society, but the female professors who benefited from this effort opened their statements by saying that they are not a feminist and this is very despairing. I think that those kinds of statements 
make it very difficult for women to come together in a solid, solid unified movement, which is why within the feminist movement there are separate branches and separate factions, which is why we have these days been talking about intersectionality theory, that gender discrimination is not necessarily something about men versus women, that to get beyond gender discrimination we have to look at the d many different complications of discrimination, that discrimination and gender discrimination, they are part and parcel of a lot larger part of prejudice and discrimination, that we have to look at inequality as a whole, not necessarily gender inequality, that we have to look at the elements of inequality, which is why one feminist organization, they sell t-shirts and enter it into a campaign where they say that feminism will complete democracy, that gender inequality and inequality itself are very closely related. So if we can see a rise in democracy, we can also see an easing of gender inequality. We're seeing the rise of new female agents. As I mentioned before, in the inconvenient courage, that there are these new female agents and new young generation who are more active in this field, in which are all very hopeful signals. But we're also seeing this mainstreaming of feminism that big protest that I said was the largest of its kind since the founding of Korea. And the online sphere has led to a more mainstreaming of this. But now we are seeing more people focusing on discrimination in society, especially in the uh, cyberspace realm. But there's also some gaps across the consciousness of the women, which is something that I'm going to talk about later on. But we also have to look at the dynamic, explosive movements of young feminists, which is is quite explosive. They tend to rise up and then disappear just as soon. The inconvenient courage was a way for the Korean feminists to start a completely new movement, but they have dissolved and disappeared. So what can we do in the midst of this current situation? If we look at a portrait of uh, men and women in their 20s, if we look at the mayoral elections in April, about 70% of men in their 20s went for the Conservative Party. 15% of the women in their 20s did not choose for any of the mainstream parties. 25.9 percent of men in their 20s were very strongly opposed to feminism. 41.7 percent of uh, women in their 20s consider themselves feminists and believe that feminism is a movement to try to give equal status and opportunity to men and women, but the women in the 20s strongly believe that they are discriminated against in society and they see that in the wage gap. This means that women in the 20s, when it comes to social cultural issues, that they tend to be more liberal compared to other demographics. And feminists are strongly critical of the current situation and the institutions in Korea. One thing that we have to look at is that women with the feminist tendency tend to be more liberal, and if they're not, they tend to be more conservative. So their attitude toward gender is a good kind of barometer in seeing their ideological tendencies. So women who are more liberal sometimes do not play politically choose vote for that party because they do not feel that the current mainstream political parties represent them, which is why there is a fight for feminists and fight within feminism, but this is really a fight for identity, which is why earlier when I talked about intersectionality theory, that this is not something that we should just uh, say it's about men versus women, but why do women worry about status and class? It's because there is more Part, work participation, economic participation, the women, but they're typically non-regular workers or temp workers, so there's high job insecurity. And of the OECD countries, Korea has the highest level of wage gap, gender wage gap. And so women say that should we just continue to call for gender inequality because there is this uh, social inequality and class inequality. So we have to also argue against that as well. And for men, 
Many feminists say that men are perpetrators, but I think that this uh, maleness is also something that has been socially organized. But we talk about how the military conscript system is made and this kind of maleness. We see how men are the breadwinners of the family, and many men feel a sense of burden regarding that. But with this globalization, Many men have felt that they are losing this status of breadwinner because of a heightened job insecurity. And in this current situation, the issue of gender, as we see in the attitude in politics, is becoming highly politicized. So what should we do in the face of this? Women have to tell men that uh, we have to try to show a world that is much better than what we're seeing right now if we can realize a gender equal world, that we can see an improvement in gender relations with gender equal world, that the world has not gotten better just automatically. With this new movement that we were able to see in, since the 90s, we're seeing this uh, all of these different movements with the abolition of the head of family system and different legislation of new laws, but I wanted to show that things don't automatically get better and improve overnight, that there's real effort involved. And I just wanted to mention that the youth generation think that we can have equal world if we have fairness, but there is this issue of the myth of meritocracy and fairness that many people think that we can look overlook inequality, but we cannot overlook any in unfairness. This is about 20% for Korea, it's about 52% for China, and less so for Germany and others. Many Koreans are not necessarily interested in equal world, but we're very sensitive when it comes to fairness and unfairness. Of course, there should be procedural fairness, which is what the young generation asks for, and this is something that we have to realize. However, fairness is also something that is currently tied in with meritocracy in Korea, which is very strong in Korean society. That meritocracy is very harsh when it comes to people who are deemed to have no merit. And this is typically seen as an individual issue, that this is not a collective issue or a government or society issue. Meritocracy is also very, uh, very uh, tied in with uh, academic background, the diplomas from good universities. And it doesn't, meritocracy doesn't say that there is the element of luck. Michael Sandel's the myth, the myth tyranny of merit is also raise the same problems, because if we look at the people who go to Harvard, there's a 20 to 1 ratio, and there is an aspect of luck involved, but these people who get in to Harvard continue to be placed on a pedestal for the rest of their lives, and meritocracy also has victims among the winners, because if you've seen in the TV drama Sky Castle, we're seeing something similar play out in the U.S., Harvard graduates. Many of them, or a high number of them, f suffer from various mental health d diseases. And also in Korea, with meritocracy, it's also it's very tied in with the moral and ethical aspects of leadership, which is why it's looking at the skills that a technocrat would have in a Korean society. So we have to identify a, co a new kind of alternative in this Korean society. We have to see how social inequality becomes political inequality, and for those communities with high levels and access to social goods might have a hegemony in the process. Because if we look at the number of people who cannot vote because they cannot take time off a vote, we can see the level of inequality there. We need to have an audacious kind of uh, decision, and we need to have um, discussions among the groups. We have civic participation and more rights, but we are worry that our democracy might be flawed. I believe that we can have true democracy when we can ease sociocultural inequality. From a low trust society, we have to go to a high trust society, have more trust and solidarity, and have a higher ties of social solidarity going forward. If we look at Finland or New Zealand, the civic studies there also really focus the importance of responsibility along with rights, that we 
are responsible for certain things, responsible, responsible to participate, responsible to vote, responsible to get to know the different issues. You have to vote in the elections and to get to know. You have to know the issues. You should not be swayed by fake news. You have to make the effort to understand the truth. And this is something that every civic-minded citizen should have. So for the youth, they might wonder, what should we do? Because there is nothing that we can do in the world. I would say that you should support grassroots movements and help the people in your community be spokespersons for the socially vulnerable people and spread a new vision forward. When there are new values or sustainable society, you can participate on social media and social networks. And we should not see any more fights and mudslings that we typically see in politics, but that we should try to look for a social consensus and the youth should facilitate this kind of social consensus. And to that end, I believe that together with the responsibility to, write to, to get to know that you, the young generation, should try to go beyond looking at individual trees and try to look at the forest as a whole. I hope that this has been some help to you in your actions and in your collective behaviors going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung Hyun Baek, for your keynote presentation. The world does not become better by itself. That really is quite inspiring. It, in it lingers in our minds. Although it may be painful, we need to look reality in the eye and take a look at what we need to do for the future. That left us great room for thought. Thank you very much. From 2.20, we will resume for session one. Please enjoy your short break and join us again at 2.20 for session one. This session will cover the work and lives of the youth. We look forward to your participation and support. And after each session, we will have a quiz event. After each session, we will have a QR code on the screen along with some quiz questions. So please utilize the URL or QR code to answer the quiz and you will be able to win some souvenirs. We look forward to your participation. We will see you again at 2.20. Thank you.